distract you and just know that he is God. And, and uh, I've done this before where I just went, and especially when I'm hunting. I find it's very interesting when you just stop and, and, and just let nature take its course around you. You begin to notice things that you've never seen before. And, and, and I've gotten all kinds of different little things like, I never knew that. And it was cool you know, watching critters run around and the way they react with one another. And, you know, but we are so busy in our life that we don't do this. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and understand him at a deeper level. Uh, our busyness keeps us from knowledge. You know, so talking about knowing who God is, being still is talking about more than not moving. It's speaking of meditating and being reflective. Uh, because of the way my brain works, uh, I, I'm the type of person that I've, I'm, I'm, I, I do two things at once a lot, and, and I'm distracted pretty quickly. And, and, but it's interesting to me when I'm mowing the grass or when I'm weed eating or something along those lines, that's when I actually start getting revelations from God. And it's just mindless work that I can do and just meditate on God. And it's like, it's interesting. You know, everybody's different. But for me, it's, that, that's what happens. And so a lot of times, if I'm having trouble with something, if I'm, if I'm having trouble writing a message or, or thinking it through a thought, I'll get on the mower and I'll just go mow. Because a lot of times I'm just out there just mowing and, and, and there's nothing to occupy my brain and boom, God starts talking. You know, the other day I was, I was running the vacuum for, for Miss Bridget, and uh, I was running the vacuum, and, and I asked her before I started, I said, are you going to let me do my way or your way? And she said, you can do it your way, I don't care as long as you're helping me. And I said, okay. But I hear running the vacuum, and, and I vacuumed the whole house in 45 minutes, so it takes the girls two and a half hours. So I proved the fact that you can do it quick. But as I'm, as I'm running the vacuum, and I'm just sweeping, you know, I just began, I was meditating on the scripture and just boom, I just started getting understanding and understanding come and revelation come. And I'm just like, this is great. And I didn't tell her that until now, but she'll want me to vacuum all the time now. You know, but giving God room to talk, giving him space to talk, that's how we know him. We got to make sure that our hectic lifestyle does not get in the way. That's what we have to do. So God created us and built us for relationship with him. We belong to him, and we owe him gratitude for every breath, every moment, and everything. So we need to give him space. But, so we're going to talk tonight about El Shaddai. Uh, El Shaddai, the God of more than enough, the God, almighty God, the all-sufficient one. Uh, and this, this name has its first appearance in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And I'm going to read that, and then we're going to break through this, and there's a lot of different avenues I'm going to try to go in in a short amount of time, uh, but it's a very interesting name, El Shaddai. It's a very interesting name. Genesis 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. And I believe the best translation of this, is even, we'll see this in a minute, but it's all sufficient one. You know, in, English, in English, the best they could come up with was God Almighty, but that actually does not give the full picture of the word El Shaddai, of the name El Shaddai. It only gives us one aspect, as we're going to look at here in a minute. But the all sufficient one is a much, a much better way to translate what the Greek had said about this, or what the Hebrew had said about this. Uh, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. So Abraham, just to give a little bit of context to this, uh, in this chapter, he becomes, or Abram becomes Abraham in this chapter. Uh, he was 99 years old. Uh, previous to this, he stepped outside of God's plan. He stepped into his own destiny and tried to take his destiny out of God's hands and say, I'm going to do things my way. And, and, you know, Ishmael was produced. But it was right after this that, that God comes to him and says, when he was 99 years old, you know, he says, the Lord appeared to him and says, I'm El Shaddai, I'm God Almighty. And, and, and so I think it's interesting, you know, how a lot of the characters in the Bible, their lives parallel the struggles and stuff that we have in our own life. You know, and so, you know, some people stay only in the New Testament. Some people stay only in the Old Testament. Uh, I believe you need the whole Bible, you know. I believe you need it all, but, but I always relate things to myself. But, but God's destiny for our life is way better than anything we can come up with. 
I mean, it is way better. What his plans are, they are way better for us. But I think it's interesting how we do the same thing when God doesn't act in the way that we want him to or the way that we think he should or in the time frame that we want him to act in, and we try to, try to pull our destiny out of his hands and place it in our own hands. You know, and this is, we're all susceptible to this. We all do this to one degree or another, uh, and we're all impatient. Uh, and it's just, it's part of a fleshly nature that we have to overcome. But we all do this to one degree or another. Some people do it at a much larger scale. But what I've found is the deeper your relationship is with God, the less likely you are to pull things out of his hands and try to control them. You know, and, and it is, and sometimes, and I'll be the first to tell you, when you don't spend enough time with God in the word, sometimes it's, you find yourself in a place where you're in opposition to God a lot. You've know, you got to stay in the Word. You've got to stay in the Word. But His destiny for your life is better than any plan you ever come up with. So if you're going to trust somebody with your life, who better to trust than God? Who better to trust than Him? He created you with a purpose. Um, I like Psalm 100, verse 3. It says, Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us. We are His. And again, there's a lot that can be said on that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, just a few seconds, but there's a lot that can be said about this. Acknowledge, understand, He is God. The Lord is God. He is the one who made us, and we are His. We belong to Him. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. You know, and so, so trusting Him with our, our plans and our, and our homes and our futures and our kids and all that, that, that should be a second, or it should be our first response to everything. God, I'm just going to trust you. But it, oftentimes, you know, sometimes, well, I won't say for many, for some people, it's an afterthought. After things start to go crazy, then they want to include God to fix it. And it doesn't always work that way. But Jeremiah 29, 11, we read this today. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God can be trusted with our futures. God can be trusted with our destiny and our purpose. You know, and Abraham, you know, what we see here is exactly that. He was watching he was watching his life just go away. And, and the promise that God gave him was not being fulfilled. And, and uh, again, I try to put myself where he was. It was something like 25 years that he waited. 20-some years that, that he waited for this, for, for a promised son. 25 years. You know, we have trouble waiting 25 minutes. I mean, if we're going to be truthful, you know, you go to any restaurant, and if, that, if you have to wait 25 minutes... For, for the waitress to come to your table, you're usually going to get up and leave. Like, for me, I'll be, the, I'll be honest. I don't, I don't, I, we call ahead seating, and if they tell me it's more than 25 minutes, I ain't going. I'll find somewhere else to eat because I just don't want to wait. It's not that good. And is it good? It is good, but it's not good enough to wait more than 25 minutes. But can you imagine 25 days waiting for something? Can you imagine 25 weeks waiting for something? 25 months waiting for something? Or 25 years Day in, day out, day in, day out. God, where are you at? God, I don't see it. Where is it at? 25 years. I mean, I think about that, and I'm like, that's a long time to not get what you're asking for, what you were promised, what you were promised. But we're no different. How many times have we prayed about something and then sought immediate results, became discouraged, upset that we didn't get the immediate results? You know, and so here Abraham and Sarah, they stepped out of sight of God's plan and they tried to force the promise and because they didn't get it when they wanted it and then so God in chapter 17 appears to Abram and he gives him his name he says I'm El Shaddai I am God Almighty I am the all-sufficient one I'm the God of more than enough and I think it's worth mentioning here also that God appeared to Abraham you know I used to think about this you know how did Abraham you know just trust God just to leave his family I mean that's there's there's a lot to what, what happened in his life, Abram, whenever God called him out of his, people's, his father's house, and he just said, hey, we're leaving. See ya. Come on, wife. Come on, servants. Come on, nephew. We're out of here. You know, and, and again, I, I always try to relate myself. What would that look like? What would that look like? We, we don't have, we're selling, our, we're getting rid of our home, Bridget. We're, we're just going to be nomads, and we're just going to wander until God says stop. You know, I, I, think, I, I think it's worth mentioning that he had a special relationship with God. And the fact that God appeared to him, I think, is a key to this. There was a, there was a deep relationship here. You know, it doesn't say how God appeared to him. It doesn't say what form or fashion. 
I don't believe that God revealed himself in a bird or in a, or in a, a, a donkey walking by. I, don't, I think it was probably in a way that he knew that it was God. You know, Abraham or, or Moses saw God in a burning bush. The children of Israel had a fire by night and a cloud by day. There was something spectacular about God appearing to them that caused them to trust in him. And it, and it comes from relationship and intimacy. But what's interesting about the names of God is they, they're revealing who he is. And, and with God, it, it's, it's progression. This is where it's kind of interesting. There are levels with God. There are, there are levels. Uh, children are at a level, I think, probably higher than most adults. And somewhere along the line, they get smart, and then they get smart, <laughs> they get common sense smart, and then they lose that connection. You know, I think the faith of a child, the reason that that's brought up is because they just blindly follow. They just blindly trust. They don't ask questions. They just, hey, go do that. Okay. And they go do it. Hey, I'll, I'll take care of this. Don't worry about it. And they, they come in, sit down, eat food that they're expected to have on the table. And they don't have a care in the world about it. Somewhere along the line, they, they grow up and have common sense. And then they start overthinking and overanalyzing things. And that's what it was for me. I overanalyzed too much things. And I sit and I think, and, you know, God doesn't talk to me like he did Abraham, so maybe I'm not saved. And these stupid thoughts that come into your head, you know, and, and but there are levels with God. And, and it's an unarguable fact that some Christians seem to experience a closer intimacy with God than others do. I mean, we cannot argue that fact. It is, it is, a, it is a known fact, and it's proven by Scripture. But, but there are people who have a deeper walk and a deeper understanding and a deeper revelation. Like the young person that I was, that I was sharing with. I was there at a teenager and questioning my faith in God, even to the degree that maybe I, I'm head this all wrong, and is God even real? You know, there's a question that our teens are, are faced with right now, the reality of God. Is he, does he actually exist because he doesn't talk and communicate with me? And, and, and the, the, the lack of discipleship, and I won't get into that because it comes from the home first and then the church, but the lack of discipleship in a child's life causes them to question the existence of God. Parents should be the ones who instill the values of faith in their kids and help them to be discipled and grow. The parents' first responsibility is to disciple their children. I mean, that's first and foremost responsibility. But, but I can remember sitting there with these same thoughts. I don't even think I love God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, you know, I try, but I'm very bad at this, God, and I don't think I love you. And then people saying, you've got to have a love for God. And, you know, as a teenager, I'm sitting there, I don't feel that love for God. And, you know, but I, I can tell you, as I grew spiritually, the, the love for God grew along with that. And as I begin to love the Word of God, I begin to love His voice. I begin to love the way that He speaks to me, the, st the, the still, the quiet voice in my heart. You know, when I'm doing something and, and, or I'm frustrated and, and God will speak a word of knowledge or, or speak something from Scripture right into my mind, and I'll be like, that was what I needed right now. That's what I needed in this moment. And, you know, and I was encouraged by that. But, but there are levels with God. There are levels. Uh, Scripture and experience teach us that we, not God, determine the degree of intimacy that we have and enjoy. That's a pretty, pretty bold statement, but God doesn't determine how much of him that you have. You do. You do. Uh, in this moment, we're as close to God as we choose to be. We're as close to him as we choose to be. The more we learn of God, the closer we become, the deeper our revelation comes. But here's the truth. Having a deep revelation of God costs us something. And for most people, that's the price they don't want to pay. So they settle for a less than expectation of God because it costs too much to have the deeper revelation. Deeper revelation comes from time in prayer. Deeper revelation comes from time in Scripture. Deeper revelation comes in those moments and the times whenever you're giving up whatever entertainment so that you can spend time with God. You know, I've said this before, discipline eventually becomes devotion. But when you start out, discipline, it hurts. You know, and, and it's like going to the weight room. And I always relate to this because I can remember every time that I get out of the weight room, the first six weeks are the worst because my muscles are sore. I'm tired. I don't want to get up early. I don't want to go in. I don't want to put forth the effort. But after eight weeks, I begin to enjoy what I'm doing. It's the same thing. The deeper you go with God, the more it'll cost you, but it's the, 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 payoff, the payoff is so much better. 
Uh, everything in our Christian life and service flows out of this relationship. It's worthy of a pursuit. It's worthy of a pursuit. So there are levels. And so, so we can see this in Scripture. Exodus 6. This is what God said to Moses. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. So again, Yahweh is God's personal name. And so, so just, just by using this as a, as a broad example, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the patriarchs of faith. They, are, they, are, they were the initiate. This is where it all started. You know? And so God, he appeared to them as El Shaddai, the God of more than enough, but he took it a step further for Moses. And he says, I'm, this is my personal name. I'm Yahweh. I'm Yahweh. And, and Moses, uh, other than Christ, I don't know that anyone else in Scripture had an experience with God like Moses did. I think he probably, other than Jesus, I think he was the only one that experienced God in, in such a, a dramatic and, and profound way. And you just, Moses is, I just love reading about Moses, but you know, God said, I, I speak to Moses as a friend, face to face. You know, and, and it's interesting. But with Moses, he revealed his personal name. Uh, he's a relational, unchanging, personal, intimate God. You know, one who protects and provides. Uh, and so Moses' life, there's a progression of this relationship with God too. God keeps revealing a deeper depth of his character with Moses. And you see this again and again and again. Moses came more closely to God than anyone else. Uh, and so he went through these progressions. Moses had mountain moments. You know, I was, I was at a conference this, this past week, at the beginning of the week, and, and one of the things that one of the speakers says, we need to have more mountain time with God. We need to have more mountain time. And mountain time is what we were discussing earlier when we eliminate all the distractions and we go and just get alone with God. You know, this is what God said. God said, come up to my mountain, talk to me. And, and God gave him revelations. I mean, this is where God, on the mountain is where God gave him all the details for the tabernacle. I mean, everything that you see written as, as, and, and some of the most boring parts of reading is reading all the items and all the things that have to be, and, and God says, make it exactly like I showed you. you know, and so, so that's very, that's, you, go, you go through Scripture, that's the stuff that most teenagers won't read because it's boring. It's boring, talking about all the elements of the tabernacle. But, but you don't get that deep revelation from just a Sunday visit to the mountain. You know? <laughs> it's, it's not a Sunday and Wednesday visit to the mountain that you get it. It's a continuum. He was up there. For 40 days fasting. And it was a supernatural event because anybody would have died if anyone else would have tried. If you try to fast for 40 days with no water and no food today, you'll die. You will die. Three days. Three, three days without water, you die. I think you can go eight without food. Some people longer, depending on how large you are. But, uh, I, but it was a supernatural thing that took place, and God revealed himself at deeper levels. But I thought it was interesting. M Moses had mountain moments with God. He sought God at a deeper level, and, and this is where he said, show me your glory. This is where he said, show me your glory. You know, I, you gave me your personal name, I want more. And see, that's the other thing. The more time you spend with God, the hungrier for God that you become. And, and what you were with yesterday isn't enough to carry. I need more now. I need more, and I need more. He says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And, and, and I, I have Exodus 33 pulled up here, and I, don't, I was debating on whether or not to go through it, because if we do, we're not going to get any further in this. We'll have to pick this up next week. Uh, but, but I just, talking about relationship with God, I just think that this is something that's worthy of, of looking at, and, and I'm okay with taking my time to go through this. But Exodus 33 uh, I'm going to start at verse 12. Let me make sure I want to start at verse 12. Yeah, verse 8 says, Whenever Moses went up to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand at the entrance of their own tent. One of the interesting things is, is God desired to meet with the people also. At the beginning of all this, God said, I want to meet with the people. The people says, we don't want to meet with God. He scares us. You know, and so there's, there's an interesting, if you want to go back and read that. But verse 12, one day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. 
<clears throat> excuse me, he says, you have told me I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If this is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your way so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. Then the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses says, if you do not personally go with us, do not make us leave this place. Just, just take for this for, for a moment and think about that. Just, just, I'm not willing to take one more step, God, unless you go with me. I am not willing to do anything more. You know, God, God you said this and that, and, and, and but God, if you're not going to go with me, I'm not willing to go any further. You know, we, if we apply that to our own lives, uh, I, I think we would find ourselves not in bad situations. I think we'd find ourselves in, because God's not going to go with this bad situation. But, but this is his heart. He says, I, I want to know you more fully. He said, I want to understand you more fully, and I want to continue to enjoy your favor. One of the things about El Shaddai is he's the God of more than enough. He's the God of, uh, of, of all sufficiency. He provides blessings. He provides all these wonderful things for them. You know, and, and, and so we should have the same desire to know God more fully, to, to enjoy more of his favor. And I just love, though, that he says here, I will personally go with you. And, God, and Moses says, if you don't go with us, don't make us leave. If you're not going to go with us, don't make us leave. Uh, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from the other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I will look favorably upon you, and I will know you by name. And, and I, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. I, I like reading out of the New Living Translation. It's just more simple English to read. Uh, some people don't like it. I just think it's more easily to understand. But I like the way it says. He says, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. I, I really wish that I, I can say at the end of my life that God would have the same thing to say about me. I know you by name. You know, I want to have that kind of relationship with God. And I think we should all endeavor for that. It was after this, Moses said, then show me your glorious presence. Show me your glory. God, show me your glory. The Lord replied, I will make all of my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you, my personal name. I'll call it out before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord continued, Look, stand near me on this rock, and my glorious presence passes by. I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. And so what is so interesting about this is what Moses experienced, we have available to us. And I know some people are like, really? Yeah, you do. You do. You have a greater deposit than what he had. You have the Holy Spirit. So, so number one, you have a greater deposit. But what I can understand through Scripture is the more of God that you want and seek after, the more he reveals to you. And this is what we see with Moses' life. You know, we see this. You know, he wasn't content with a burning bush. He was not content with, with God just looking favorably on him and knowing his name. He says, I want more, and I want more. And he says, God, I want, to, I, want to, I want to see your glory. And God revealed himself, but only after Moses sought him. You know, only after Moses said, I want relationship with you. And, and, and I'm not trying to make a weird doctrine or nothing out of all this, but what I am saying is you can have as much of God as you want. And really, it's up to us. James says the same thing. It's the same thing. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God. This is a command to us, and he will draw near to you. you know, so, so the level of God that you have is the level that you've chosen. The level that you've chosen. And if you want a deeper level, you have to walk in deeper places. You know, and, and so the closer you become to God, the closer he becomes to you. And so the Bible does say in John that God initiates. John 6, 44 says he, he's the one who initiates. He draws, but then he stops there. And, and it's almost as if he's saying, how much further would you like to go? It's up to you. you know? And again, this is where we have to have this pursuit. Uh, but 
He appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and declared, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully. Live a blameless life. That's what he said. He said to, to Abram, he said, live a blameless life, serve me faithfully. And so this name El Shaddai, we're going to get into this a, a little bit here. This name El Shaddai, when it's broken apart and examined more closely, we learn a little bit about it. Uh, the best way to put it is the all-sufficient one. You know, El Shaddai, the short, it's, El is the shortened version of Elohim, which means God, creator, all-powerful. We learned about that a couple weeks ago. Uh, but, but it's the shortened version, El, El. Then we have Dei, and it's sufficient to pour out plenteous, a continual pouring out. And then we get into, there's, there's, two, there's two forms of uh, uh, shad. And, and this is where it gets interesting, and, and uh, there, there's dual meanings here. And so shad means mother's breast. That's what that word actually means, mother's breast nourishing, supplies, it provides, it blesses, it sustains, and it satisfies. And so, so when we think about this in, in terms that we might want to understand, think of a baby, when, when the baby's at home. Uh, what does a baby need and long for? What do they need and long for? Nourishment. They need nourishment. Uh, it needs safety, it needs provision, it needs satisfaction. So as a mother would care for an infant, they provide for all these needs. A mother provides for all these needs. Uh, God provides that in the same fashion for us. He's the giver of life. He brings life-giving nourishment. He alone can produce life and sustain it. And as we saw, and if you go and you read uh, in Gen Genesis 17, it was through a dead womb that he did this. Her, Sarah's womb was dead, and he became the all-sufficient one and brought life to a dead womb. You know, so we look at God, he's nourishing, and he's continually pouring out everything that we need, continually supplying what we need for life, satisfaction, blessing, and nourishment. And as an infant would naturally look to its mother for fulfillment of this, God is saying, I will be this in your life. I am the all-sufficient one. I will be this. You know, and so practically, this means he's going to continually overflow in our reality, our life. And so practically, uh, we talk about this name. I've heard this name used this way, but, but you know, when somebody is, is in want, I don't have enough money to pay my bills. You know, again, go to God. Who owns all the gold and all the silver? Haggai 2.8 says, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Psalms 50.10 says, For all the animals of the forest are mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I'm the all-sufficient one. I will provide for you nourishment. Whatever you might need, I have it. I, I have everything that you need, and I'm willing to give it to you. He is the source of all things. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and this is the amplified version. It says, yet for us, there is only one God, the Father. And here it is, who is the source of all things for whom we have life and one Lord Jesus Christ through and by whom are all things and through and by whom we ourselves exist. You know, so he is, the, he is the source of all life. You know, and just the same as a mother is the source of all life for, for an infant. That, that child will not live unless that mother picks that child up, cares for it, protects it, and nourishes it. And this is what God's saying in this name, El Shaddai, part of this name is, I am going to provide this for you. This is what I'm doing for you. So he's saying, I am El Shaddai, I am the God of more than enough. I will satisfy you personally. You know, and, and you know, he has grain bins that never run out. He's got jars of oil that never run dry. He's got bank accounts that never empty out. He's got food pantries that are never, never bare. You know, he's the God of more than enough. And this is who he is. You know, how, how many remember the, the Amy Grant song, El Shaddai? I think, Autumn, you've sang that before, and you can sing that any time again, because I love that song. I do love that song. But this is where the second meaning of this word comes in. You know, I, I'm going to read just part of the lyrics. I'm not going to sing it for you. But El Shaddai, El Shaddai. El Elyon Adonai, age to age, you're still the same. God, you've not changed. You're still the same by the power of your name, by the power of your name. You know, so the other part of this is talking about power. El Shaddai, this, the dual meaning to Shaddai is mountain. It's one of the forms of, of, that it uses as a description of it, an immovable object. Now, for most people, you would agree, uh, faith can move a mountain, but Jack's mountain has been there as long as I've been here. You know, it's an immovable thing. So in, in this fashion, 
It's, it's meaning power, absolute power, great strength. You know, so El Shaddai not only means nourishment, not only means provision, but it also means strength. It also means an overwhelming strength. You know, so so I, I think it's interesting, though. God doesn't change. You know, and so, so we have this all-powerful God, and, and this name really brings this into focus for us. Uh, so according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, one of the definitions of the word almighty is having absolute power. And this is why I said that even in, even in English, you know, they translate this God Almighty. It's not a, it's not a, it doesn't adequately give us the definition of this name because he is almighty, but it also he's nourishing. He's the same. It's, it's meaning has, this word has dual meanings. You know, and so the one definition, this one definition alone causes the name of El Shaddai to stand out among the other names. You know, so there's the idea of mighty strength, power, and authority. Uh, immovable, ob- uh, immovable object and overpowering strength. And so his strength is unshakable, unshakable. And, and I love Psalms seventy three twenty six. It says, my health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart forever. He is mine or he is mine forever. Uh, so what, our strength has limits. There's only so much we can physically deal with or emotionally or mentally deal with until we just, we break. But what's so cool about this is God becomes limitless strength for us. You know, and so this still, this this comes out of the same understanding that God is strong. That there's deeper levels to it. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And so the God who provides nourishment also promises to help you be victorious, to uphold you, to strengthen you, to undergird you, to come under you. And I think that's amazing, that every situation that we have, he walks with us. He walks with us. He personally strengthens us. He personally helps us. He personally will go through any and every situation with us. And I I think this is worth stopping and meditating on in quiet times, and when, when, when... the psalm that says, be still and know that I'm God, I think this is one aspect that we need to bring in. You know, not only is he all nourishing, but he's all powerful. Not only is he going to be the provider of all things for me, he's going to become my strength when I can't. When I can't. I mean, that's, that, that's what's so interesting about God is we, he knows we can't. He knows that we can't do it. And that's why he gave us his son. That's why he gave us his Holy Spirit. Because he knows without him, we're helpless. And so he provides this for us. He's the sustainer of all life. His protection, provision, and favor are blessings upon your life. Meditate on some of these things in your quiet time when you're being still and you're trying to understand God. I'll get to that in just a minute. But when your understanding goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge, then you're able to actually walk through situations without fear. You know, when you, you take this and apply it to your life, when you believe that God is the sustainer of all things, the nourisher, and he's going to provide everything, and he's going to help you have strength in every situation, then when you encounter trials and storms, you don't have to fear. You're not dismayed because when, you, when, when it goes from just knowing to now I know in my heart, this is who he is, this is his name, then you can walk and be courageous. You can, you can run and not grow weary because he provides these things. It's a comfort. It's a comfort to us. And so Elmer Towns, uh, he's a pastor, he, he's, a, he's a brilliant Christian author, and he's written many, many books, prayer and fasting. Uh, he's the co-founder of Liberty University, Elmer Towns is. Uh, if, if you want to read some good books on fasting and spiritual breakthrough, he's got a couple really good books. I recommend him. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of knowledge comes from there. But in one of his books, in regard to the name El Shaddai, he writes this. Thus, two divine qualities are implied in the name of El Shaddai. God is both the strong one who is able to deliver and the tender one who nourishes and satisfies. Unfortunately, the English word almighty tends to communicate only the aspect of God's strength and power. Some feel that the term all-sufficient would be a better translation. The twofold aspect of the, of the name Almighty God is strength and satisfaction, tough but tender. Tough and tender. And, and I mean, that, that's really, really a really great way to say it. 
You know, God's tough when he needs to be tough. And he's tender when he needs to be tender. And, and, and being a parent, this is actually very, very much needed in raising children. Uh, I, I believe half of the behavioral problems we have in children today is because parents are not tough and tender. You know, they're either one or the other. And you find that some kids act out as a way of attention. Some kids act out because they don't get any attention. You know, some get too much attention. You know, and schools become the place where they look for love. You, know, you think about that for a minute. That's, that's a disheartening thing when a parent escapes or, or a child es escapes the parent at home to go to school and that's where they're looking for love. That's where they're, and you wonder why things are so confused, you know, but, but I'm no expert in raising children. I don't get everything right, but I do, I, I, I do try to do everything that I see written in the Bible. And, and uh, there are times whenever you got to be tough. There are times when you got to say no and mean it. And, and for me, it was easy with the older two. With the younger one, it's very hard for me. Very hard for me. And I don't know if I'm just getting soft in my old age or, or what, but, but she blinks and bats her eyes and I just melt. And, and Bridget steps in and she says, no, we're going to do this. And <laughs> but but it, it's, it, it, I understand that, that there's times to be tough. and You have to not back down. And there's times you've got to be tender. But it's compassion and toughness. It's the same. You've got to do both. And God is that for us. You know, he is strong when we need him to be strong. And sometimes, sometimes he's tough on us. Sometimes he corrects us. And, and just like the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but whoever loves him is diligent to discipline. The rod is, is talking about discipline. It's talking about correction. Uh, when we need to be corrected, you know, we, should, we should be thankful that God corrects us. We really should be. You know, I, am, I tell my mom this all the time. Whenever I was a kid, I did not like her very much when she corrected me. But I'm so thankful that she beat me. And, and she didn't beat, abuse me, but when I acted out, she smacked me. And I'm okay with that. I'm happy that she did that. I'm very happy. But we need to be firm and consistent with tender toughness. You know, and this is, this is the heart of God. This is, this is El Shaddai. He is both. He is tender and he's tough. Uh, God is kind in his toughness toward us, towards us. The Lord is all-powerful. He is all-loving, but he is tough and tender. You know, we see this actually in Jesus. Jesus got very angry at religious hypocrisy. Got very upset about it, but he was very forgiving towards genuine repentance. You know, and, and, and again, if you go back to John 8, this is where I was today for a while. You see, you see the woman caught in adultery. You know, they brought her, and, and she was caught in the act. She was, she was sleeping with another man, and they caught her, and they drug her out. Most people believe she was naked. And so the shame that she was already wearing, you know, and they threw her at his feet and they were trying to entrap him. And they said, you know, what, what should we do with her? You know, and, and, you know, everybody knows the story. I hope you know the story. Jesus says, ye without sin cast the first stone. And then he starts writing stuff in the dirt and then they all leave and he's the only one left. And what do we see? He was harsh with them because they needed a harsh word, but he was tender with her. And he says, go and sin no more. You know, this is Jesus. And it's, the, it, it's, it's, or it's displayed throughout his life. But, you know, even, even as myself, not only as a father, but as a pastor, I have to do this at my home. But even in a church level, you know, I'm responsible for God's flock. This is his church. I'm the under shepherd. But, but he is going to call me in accountability for how I've governed his people. And I have to do it with, with tenderness and toughness. You know, there, there's, there's some people that won't go to a church that preaches harsh on sin. They, don't, they only want to hear the good things. That's it. And then there's some churches, all they want to hear is the tough things. You need, a, you need a blend of both. You need a blend of both. But you need to be able to say things, and, and, and as long as the Word says it, stay there. Stay in the Word. Don't deviate from the Word, but pastors need to have a backbone. I mean, they need to not move back and forth with, with whatever season comes. Uh, uh, I, I was joking just the other day uh, about we're in getting ready for this new political storm. You know, and, and so we're, we're going to come where some Christians want to preach politics. Some don't want to preach. Does it belong in the pulpit? Doesn't it belong in the pulpit? Where, does it, where do you draw the line for all this? And he says, how are you going to navigate through all that? I said, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be tough and tender. 
I've got to be tough with ones I need to be tough with. I'm going to be tender with ones I need to be tender with. But, but a president is not Christ. He is not Jesus, no matter which, one, which side he's on. But, but what's so interesting to me is the devil has worked this plan, and it's, it's, he's winning right now. He is able to split churches over political parties. And he's able to adequately do that. And, you know, and my whole thoughts on this, is, and it's never changed. I said to him, I said, I don't preach one or the other. I preach Jesus. I focus on evangelism because I have a belief that if we evangelize people, disciple them, and teach them who Christ is, have the relationship with God, then they'll vote according to the Bible. And I don't have to get up and tell them what to do. And Preach Jesus. We're kingdom people. We're not left. We're not right. We're kingdom. We are kingdom people. And uh, Dr. Tony Evans, uh, I listened to a sermon he did a couple years ago on that. And it was one of the best sermons I've heard on that. He says, Christians... Christians forget that they belong to Christ, not their party. And he said, I wish, and, and I'm pretty sure it was him that said this, so if I'm wrong, you don't, you don't have to tell me, but pretty sure he said this, I wish people would align themselves with the name of Jesus as much as they do their political party. He said, you'll have rallies, and they'll show up, whether you're for one or the other, you'll show up, and you're that party, that's who you are, period. He says, I wish Christians would show up for Jesus like that. He said, it'd be a different world, and I agree with him. I 100% agree with him. You know, yes, there's a danger of, of getting away from things, but I, I just think if we focus on Christ, that's the key. Focus on Christ. He's the only one that can fix it anyway. But anyway, there has to be a balance between tender and tough. You know, God loves each, and if we, if we excommunicate one side, then we lose the, the ability to speak into their lives. And, and that's my concern. You know, we have to be able to speak into their lives. We have to. God Almighty, El Shaddai. Uh, this shows up 48 times in the Old Testament. Seven of those 48 times, it's the full compounded word El Shaddai. Seven of those. The other times, it's, it's Shaddai. It just shows up as Shaddai, but it, it is meaning El Shaddai. Uh, what is interesting, 30, 30, 31 times, this word shows up in Job. And I'm not going to go too far into that. But the all-sufficient, all-nourishing, tough and tender one shows up 31 of the 48 times in the book of Job. Just interesting. Just interesting. You know, everybody knows Job's story. Uh, that's where the name was primarily used in the Old Testament. It, it shows up in the New Testament, and there's a Greek word that's it's a, it's a million letters long, and I can't pronounce it, so I'm not going to try. But uh, it shows up, and we see it as the same definition, Almighty God, the ruler. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. We see this word show up a lot in Revelation, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, revelation 1.8, for example, I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, says Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And so here, here again, El Shaddai, that's the form in the New Testament. But it finds its fulfillment in Christ. I think that's interesting, that, that this is who God identified with. And we know that Jesus is God with us. We know he's God's son. We know, you know he is the fleshly form of God. But it finds his, its fulfillment in the New Testament in Christ. That's where it, it shows up, in Christ. Uh, and so it's, it's just very interesting. Uh, 2 Peter 1.3, Jesus becomes all that we need. His divine power has granted us to granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Again, nourishment and strength is what we need. Through the knowledge of him who called us into his own glory and excellence, by which he was, has granted us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You know, and so El Shaddai, El Shaddai, tender, tough God, God who is nourishing, God who is strong, God who becomes our strength and our refuge, but God who also corrects us when we need to be corrected, God who provides when we, we are not able to provide for ourselves. You know, and we talk about uh, provide, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs that God is the one who gives us the strength to obtain wealth. You know, so even our, even our ability to go out and obtain a living comes from El Shaddai. It's just, it's interesting to me. Uh, but knowing his name, uh, it's just it's fascinating. And so, we're going to take us just a little bit further. 
Really, it's 755. We know that God is Elohim, the Creator, the All-Powerful One. This name, El Shaddai, actually goes a little deeper than that and introduces to his tender, loving care, and at the same time, it keeps the idea of being all-powerful. Uh, God, in the usage of this name, I thought this was interesting, he proves to us that he can do whatever he wants by using this name. The way he gives it in Genesis uh, 17, I can do whatever I want. I'm all-powerful. You know, and so, so again, we look at a dead womb. Her womb was completely dead. There was no hope of, of her having a child, and this, this defies the laws of nature. So he's the God who's outside of our creation. He's all-powerful, but he provided what he promised. He provided what he promised. I, I mean, it's just interesting. You know, what is science and physics? They tell us that there's these laws in our earth and, and that things actually happen uh, for a reason, and, and there's these rules like gravity. Uh, you can't rewrite it. You cannot rewrite gravity. We can't. He can. He can. And so El Shaddai, this is interesting, El Shaddai is, is able to operate outside of what science says that we can. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. Uh, a lot of times people limit God to existing only inside of his creation and not thinking of him outside of it. But he is outside of it. He has to be outside of it in order for him to be God. But he cannot be limited by his creation. And so here's an all-powerful, sovereign God, Elohim. He broke the laws of nature. And he did this actually many times. If you go through your Bible, God broke the laws of nature a lot. And he did things that were contrary to what science would say. And, and this is why some people have a hard time believing in God. Because they, they, they can't fathom the fact that, that Moses can stretch out his arm and a sea split. And they walk on dry ground. Uh, that a dead womb can receive life and the seed, and boom, now, now they're, having, they're having a baby. Uh, here's a, here's a, a statement that a scholar writes, and I don't know who it was, I just know he was a scholar. Uh, he was a smart person. But I like the statement, and it fits here. It says, while Elohim is the God who creates, in the name El Shaddai, God reveals himself as the God who compels nature to do what is contrary to itself. He is able to triumph over every obstacle and all opposition. He is able, so it should say he is able, not be is able. But it, oh, you don't even have it up there. Okay. He is able to subdue all things to himself. And so God has the authority to compel nature to do what is contrary to itself. This is El Shaddai. This is the God, this is the God whose name that we have as our Father. He, he's able to do that, and he's a covenant God. He's honoring his covenant. That's what we see with Abram, is he honored this covenant. But we see this many times. Uh, a man prays, and the sun stops. You know, that defies the laws of nature. That doesn't happen. Uh, the fact that Christ came in the way that he came defies the laws of nature. It doesn't happen. You know, it can happen. It's not able to happen. Uh, but, but God did this. El Shaddai did this. And so we see this in Genesis chapter 17. He shows up, and he gets right into the middle of creation, and he becomes whatever he needs to be. He's, he's honoring the covenant that he had with Abram. You know, and, and 17.1 says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you, by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. And then in Genesis 21, verse 1, we see the fulfillment of that. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he promised. She became pregnant, gave birth to a son for Abraham. In his old age, this happened at just the time God had said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. And so this is just interesting, because again, God is able, he's outside of it, he's all-powerful. He is able to defy the laws of nature to do this. Uh, there was another point that I wanted to make. I've got to find it, and then I'm going to close. Maybe I didn't write it. I don't know. Okay. That's okay. Uh, but this God, what he's done for him, he'll do for you. El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. He will do it for you. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, see, I knew I'd think of it. How many of you know what the name Abram means? 
exalted father. It's interesting to me, you go and you read, Abram was, he had no children. <laughs> he had, but his name meant exalted father. It's almost cruel to a degree. God shows up and he renames him Abraham. And, and, and uh, it really literally means I'm going to make you a father of a multitude. You know? And so this is God's covenant with him. But I just thought, found it interesting. It means exalted father, Abram. And the God of more than enough shows up, renames him, and then gives him everything that he promised. I thought that was interesting. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, but we go back and we look at this. Abraham, I used to ask this question. How, how could he take his son, tie him up, and put him on an altar? I, I could not. Today I kind of got new revelation of this. But... How do you take your son, tie him up, hog tie him, throw him on an altar, get out your knife, and prepare to butcher him? And I sit there and I think, wow, that's amazing. And I used to, I used to just marvel at that. And then today, I realized because Abraham knew that God controlled nature. And he can do things that are outside of the control of nature. He can do whatever he wants. He's El Shaddai, he's God. And he can put him right back together. If I cut him to pieces, I'm gonna, God will put him right back together because my wife was, was too old to have kids and her womb was dead and he put life in that. And if this is a God who can work outside of nature or he can twist nature to do whatever he wants it to do, then I will do this and I will faithfully serve him knowing full well that he will fulfill the promise. And I just, I always thought that was, that was always something to me I just couldn't grasp until today when I realized that he truly knew God as El Shaddai. He truly knew God as someone who was working outside of what our normal natural thinking. And, and that belief carried him to the place where God knew that, okay, you're actually going to do what I told you to do. And it's just interesting to me that, that God, he, he showed that answer to me today. He understood that God could bend the laws of nature if he needed to. So that should inspire us and want us, cause us to want to grow in our faith. I want us to have a deeper revelation. And, and so that's all I'm going to share. It is 8.02. Anybody have anything they want to add? Since I put it on you to hold us tonight. Okay. Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for who you are. God, you are El Shaddai. You are the God of more than enough, the all-sufficient one, God. I thank you, Lord, that you're a discipliner. And I thank you that you're tough. I thank you that you're our strength when we need strength, but you also are tender and kind and compassionate and loving. God, I thank you that, Father, all the resources that you have have been given to us in Christ Jesus. And, Father, that, that you withhold no good thing back from your children. And, Father, I thank you that, that you will come as close to us as we want to be with you. And, Father, we can expect to have a, a deeper progression of a relationship the same as Moses did so father I pray Lord as we continue to go through this series and we learn about your names and your personal your personal touch on on humanity and, and who you really are God I pray that father that each of us would continue to go deeper and deeper and father have greater revelation father that we may be able to have the intimate relationship with you that you desire to have with us and Father, I thank you. I thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, I pray for your blessing upon each person as we depart from this place, Lord. And God, I pray, Father, for your favor to be upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Have a great evening. God bless you.